once again, uh, uh, studying the book of Psalms. And this is Psalms 50. This is the Psalm of Asap. Um, and it's a psalm that people will recognize, but it oftentimes gets overshadowed by the very next psalm, which is probably one of the most, next to Psalms 23, maybe another one of the most famous psalms, and that's Psalm 51. But we won't get there yet. But I definitely want to uh, let uh, be aware of the fact that oftentimes this one gets over looked a bypass because everybody wants to get right to Psalm 51 and deal with that. But I think it's important that we recognize in Psalm 50, you got a lot of things in there that will help you so you won't get to a situation where you're dealing with the things that are being dealt with in Psalm 51. If you understand 50, help, hopefully it will uh, help to avoid you from dealing with the Psalm 51 subject of, of falling into all kinds of problems and sin, um, and you be aware that you are on God's radar. And I think that's the thing that you, I'm going to take from this psalm, is that God's, God's here. He sees it. He sees the hurt. He sees the pain. He sees all the frustration. He understands it. And he's also going to deal with it. Nobody's getting away. And oftentimes, what we think we're doing we think, oh, I'm, I'm doing this for God. I'm doing this in the name of God. I'm doing this to bless God. And God is like, I don't want that stuff. And he's going to tell us that straight up. I don't want that. That's not what I want. You think that's what I, you think that's what I need? And so without any delay, let's go ahead and let's get into this. Let's listen to the, the psalm, and then we're going to try to break it down a little bit. Psalm 50. Psalm 50. Almighty God... Even the Lord hath spoken, and calleth the earth from the rising of the sun unto the going down thereof. Out of Zion, the perfection of beauty, God hath shined. Our God shall come, and shall not keep silence. A fire shall devour before him, and it shall be very tempestuous round about him. He shall call to the heavens from above, and to the earth, that he may judge his people. Gather my saints together unto me, those that made a covenant with me by sacrifice. And the heaven shall declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Selah. Hear, O my people, and I will speak, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices or thy burnt offerings to have been continually before me. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he goats out of thy folds. For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Will I eat the flesh of bulls, or drink the blood of goats? Offer unto God thanksgiving and pay thy vows unto the Most High, and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee, and thou shalt glorify me. But unto the wicked God saith, What hast thou to do to declare my statutes, or that thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth? Seeing thou hatest instruction, and castest my word behind thee, when thou sawest a thief, then thou consentest with him, and hast been partaker with adulterers, Thou givest thy mouth to evil, and thy tongue frameth deceit. Thou sittest and speakest against thy brother. Thou slanderest thine own mother's son. These things hast thou done, and I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as thyself. But I will reprove thee, and set them in order before thine eyes. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Whoso offereth praise glorifieth me, and to him that ordereth his conversation aright will I show the salvation of God. All right, there we go. Now, um, this psalm is kind of divided into a couple of sections. We're going to start off with that, uh, the first six verses, and it's kind of talking as though someone is speaking on God's behalf. But then we're going to turn as the Spirit of God is speaking as God directly and giving us some insight. So we want to take a note of that, and we'll try to make note of that when we make that change. 
All right, so the first thing that we notice here when we uh, take a look at this psalm, it, it, it identifies who we're dealing with. Not dealing with God, we're dealing with the mighty God. Now, it's important that we recognize that the word mighty is put in front of that. And, if we could, and, and you could have put a lot of other words, you know, the everlasting, the, the, the all-powerful, uh, the most high. There's so many different, but the point that he's trying to make here is that I am above and greater, and I have authority and I have power. I am mighty. All right? Um, you remember when, when I was a kid, we used to watch this cartoon called Mighty Mouse. I don't know if y'all remember that one. And it was this little tiny mouse, and all he, he, he had the ability to just do all kinds of stuff. He could lift a house, lift everything. He was for a size of a mouse. He was just mighty. Well, and that gives you a concept, but it is in no way a comparison because God is even greater than that. Mighty means, from a standpoint of identifying God, that I need you to understand that whatever it is that, that you come up against or that tries to come up against uh, God will not be equal to the task. Everything falls below the power of God. Now, when you say everything, what about your problem? What about your difficulty? What about your ailment? What about your disappointment, your heartbreak, your, your failure? All of that. When we go through stuff, we just think that it's, 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 it's too much. But God is letting you know, I am mighty. But the question is, do you call him God or do you see him as mighty God? And that's an important thing because we know God can do all things. But a mighty God can and will fix the problem. See, we have to believe he will deal with it. But he's going to get to it in a minute. Let me not get ahead of myself. So he says, the mighty God, even the Lord have spoken. All right? So Lord, meaning what? The person that gives instruction. Someone that says, I'm so above you that you should listen to me. Why? Jesus identified it. He said, why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not what I say. So what God is saying, I'm the one you're supposed to get instruction from. You want to know how to live life? I'm the manual. Okay? When you get a, a car or, or, or an appliance, you get a manual that comes with it. It tells you what to do. Well, God is telling you, us, I am the manual for life. You've got an issue, something's not working right, you bring it to me. We're going to visit that again. So keep that in mind. So he says, I'm the Lord. Uh, have spoken and have called the earth from the rising of the sun until the going down thereof. So what he's saying is the Lord has spoken and he spoke, he has given uh, uh, his word to all the world from the beginning to the end every day. What this is saying is that God is ever speaking, ever seeking, ever trying to pull us in, ever trying to lift us up, ever trying to show us the, 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 uh, what do you would call that? The, uh, the the silver lining in the dark clouds. He's ever trying to point that out to us. But are we the ones that are hard of hearing and dull and focused on our own agenda, our own issue, our own struggle, our own uh, achievements, or whatever it may be? All right? And God is letting you know that when you, when you deal with the things that I'm dealing with, there's nothing that I can't deal with. I've been in all the earth, and I've been from the beginning to the end, from the rising to the going down. I've been there. I'm God. Then it goes on. And he says, O Zion, now he's speaking to that, that nation that of called, the people that he has called out, Israel. It also reflects to the church, but specifically it's to Israel. Out of Zion, the, the, the perfection of beauty, God has, signed, has, has shined. Okay? Um, and it's a prophetic aspect because out of Zion, God will shine because that's where Jesus will come from. Okay? God come in flesh. 
Right? So he will show himself and then come down and show us how to live in frustration and poverty and disappointment and rejection. He's going to show us how to look, how to live when people don't, don't care about you, don't love you, mistreat you, lie on you, betray you. He's going to show you how to love your enemy, care for strangers, help people that are afflicted. Jesus came and, as a man and showed us how to do all of that. All right? But he came forth and did that. So and it lets us know that, yes, he knows we can't do it. That's why he had to come. But our confidence then has to be, God can do it in me. I can't do it. But I need God to help me. And then when I stumble, God will patch up my life and keep me going. I don't know if you, you kind of remember back in the day, you know, when you got a, a, a hole in some pants or a hole in the jacket or something, you need to throw that out. You got some patches, man. You patch that thing up and you kept on going. And it's kind of funny now because that's in style. That's the style now. You get the, you get these clothes, these, these pants, and they got rips and holes and stuff all in them. And uh, they, they wear, you know, with pride and with, uh, you know, like, well, I'm, I'm in style. And you got the jackets with the patches and everything. Uh -huh. But back in the day, that was, you know, out of necessity. Okay. Um, but what that uh, lets us know is that God will provide. He will, he will give. He will bring forth. All right. Um, it speaks about uh, the beauty, which is we've talked about, which is uh, brought forth in the life of Christ. Uh, and uh, that's something that oftentimes we overlook. His life was beautiful. The scripture says, though, that when he was uh, finished being martyred and beaten by the world, there was no beauty in him that someone would desire. So the beauty was not in his physical appearance because he was beaten and bloodied and bruised. Um, but his life was a life of perfection. The perfection of beauty is what he, what the Lord Jesus um, displayed. Verse 3. Our God shall come and shall not be silent. Ah, that's important. See, oftentimes you say, well, I, I'm, I'm struggling and I've been struggling for a day. I've been struggling for a week. I've been struggling for a month. I've been struggling for, you know, uh, uh, five or ten years. I, somebody else said, I've been struggling all my life. And, and, and that may be true. I'm not, and I would never deny anybody the ability to say that, that life has not been easy for you. If, life, if that's your story, then that's your story. But just because you got a time frame that you can label and it may have some, some length to it, does not mean God will not show up. Now you go, well, well, my goodness, well, how long do a person have to wait? Well, you talk to Abraham. How long did he wait? They quit. They gave up many times because God promised him a child. And they waited till he was well past the time when a person at his age would be capable of having a child. But God showed up. See, what we keep doing is we, we keep putting God in our reality. We keep putting God in the realms in which things make sense to us. And we forget that this psalm opened up and told us he's a mighty God. He doesn't need our mechanics, our physics, our human abilities, and our human attributes. Uh, you don't have to be 20 to be super strong. You can be old, and if God comes upon you, you'll be strong. And that's the part that sometimes it's hard to do because we want God to fit into how we see the world. And he's not going to uh, appease us on that every time. There are times when he meets our expectations. He's right there just like we think he should be. But oftentimes, he comes in a different way, which is why the scripture says the Lord works in mysterious ways. It's for that reason. Because God's going to work the way he sees and not the way we see it. And that's always an important thing to keep in mind. God shall come and shall not be silent. When he comes, you're going to know it's him. He's not going to come and you're like, oh, who? I wonder who that was. You're going to know that was God. Okay? He said, and shall not be silent. He says, a fire shall devour before him. All right? So what that's telling you is when he does come, 
He's not only coming as God, but he's also coming as judge. And that means that if you are in the place where you are uh, lived in a mean where devour uh, is your, your, your future, then you will be devoured. Now, what does that mean? I don't know. I just know that it says the fire. It says he was consuming fire. It says that it uh, talks about hell as being smoke and brimstone. I don't know what all that adds up to. I don't know what it all uh, means. I, I have concepts, but I know my concepts are very limited. I can't tell you what it is. I can only tell you what I can imagine. But I tell you this. You don't want God's fire on you as a sense of rebuke. As a, or as a sense of destruction. Let me correct myself. God's fire on you as rebuke is not a bad thing because he rebukes whom he loves. But if his fire is on you for destruction, then you are lost. And I want to make sure I make that correction because the Lord will put fire on those whom he loves as, re as a rebuke to correct them. But the, the, uh, the lost will get everlasting fire. Right? And that's something that uh, uh, nobody would want to have. And, and sadly, though, that the scripture says that many will be lost. Uh, the, the, the road to destruction is filled with those that walk that way, unfortunately. So he says, uh, the, fire was, the, the fire shall devour before them, and it shall be very tempestuous. That means it's not going to be fun. It's going to have a problem. There's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus said it many times. Round about him. A lot of people are going to be wondering, God, <laughs> uh, I know I've done wrong. Because see, the thing is, the, the blinder that, you, that people have will be removed. And you'll see your, 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 fallacy, your fallacies. You'll see your incorrect thinking, your incorrect behavior. You'll see your bad judgment. You'll see... You can't always see it now, but you'll see it then for those that are lost. Uh, for we that love the Lord and still have bad judgment, the scripture says we judge ourselves. So when we confess our sins, he is faithful and, judge, faith, faithful and just to forgive us of all iniquity. And one of the sins that we have to always make sure that we confess is that uh, I, I might not be doing it right, though I believe I am. There's a lot of things that I look at. I, I think I'm doing this right. I think I'm going, but I may not be. And I think about the man that came to Jesus, and Jesus asked him, do you believe? And the man just straight up, and I, I, I tell you, that's one of the most honest answers. He says, I do believe. But I know I also probably got unbelief. So he said, I believe, but help my unbelief. So it's an awareness that I'm not, I know I'm not covering every aspect of this. I'm not dotting every I. I'm not crossing every T. And there are things that I'm missing that I don't even know about that I'm missing. There's so many things that, that we can be aware of if, if we were to try to do uh, a, a full and complete uh, job that we don't even see. And, and how many times have people gone about different things and said certain things and like, oh, I just said that, but didn't realize, well, you, yeah, but you cut that one down, you hurt that person's feelings, you made that person feel little, you made that person feel inadequate. Didn't mean to, but you did. Right? And so you got to accept all of that. You got to be aware that, yeah, I'm probably not handling everything perfect, but I'm, I'm doing what I can do. And I'm praying for God to, 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 to enlighten me and to help me and to guide me. Why? Because we recognize that uh, this stuff is all around us. All right? Look at verse 4. He shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may judge his people. Now, when Jesus said, to pray, he said, pray after this manner. And he, and he said in that prayer that we should pray that thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what that tells us is that God allows perfection to continue to reign in heaven, which is why Satan had to be what? Kicked out of heaven. 
Because once iniquity was found in him, he can't be in a place that is perfection. And that's why the scripture said, in heaven, there was war in heaven. To what? To maintain the status of heaven. He had to be kicked out. And so then here it says, uh, and he shall call to the heavens from above and to the earth that he may make, that he may judge his people. When he comes to earth, he's, he's coming from heaven, from the heavens to earth to bring to earth what he's already established in heaven. In heaven, he established the iniquity and that which would cause confusion has been in eradicated. It's been kicked out. He's allowing it to happen on earth. But when he comes to earth, guess what's going to happen? He's going to put the same type of correction on earth that he already established in heaven. So earth is going to have a, 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 a big clean, a big wipe, a big sterilization, so to speak. Folks of, of folks of, hmm? A day of reckoning. A day of reckoning. Opinion <laughs> said. Yep, it's going to happen. It's coming. All right. So verse verse five. Gather my saints together unto me. Well, when it comes to earth, that's one of the things that he's going to be able to make sure that it's it's already taken care of. His saints will be protected. He's coming to correct the things on earth, but the saints will be gathered together unto me. Those that have my covenant with me by sacrifice. Now, what does that mean? That means that I'm sacrificing. Okay. I'm accepting, first of all, the sacrifice that was applied for me. That's the sacrifice of Jesus on the cross. Next, I'm sacrificing my own uh, 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 way to acknowledge God's way. There are a lot of things I think I want to do. There's feelings that people have. I feel like I want to do this. Or I feel like I want to do that. Or I have a feeling. Or you know what? All my life, I felt like I wanted to be this or do that or do and when you come to God, you have to put those feelings in check. And then say, how do my feelings align up with God? And if my feelings don't align with God, I got to put them in check. You know what? Based on what God's word saying, I felt like this. I've been wanting to do this all my life. I wanted to go out there, man, and be a playboy and have all my little stuff. Or go out there and gamble and swindle. Or go out there and take advantage of people that don't pay attention. There's a lot of people out there, they, li they live in this world... I had a guy at my job say that his father told him, take advantage of everybody you can because there's a sucker born every day. And that's how some people live. Now, if you if you have that in you, the, the, the probable bad scenario is that you're probably good at it too. You know, if you if you if it's easy for you to lie, you're probably a good liar. If it's easy for you to steal, you've been thinking about stealing all your life, you're probably a good thief. But guess what? All that's got to be dealt with. You got to look, once you come into awareness of the sacrifice that Jesus made, now I got to make a sacrifice. I'm accepting him, then I got to find out what he is laying out and go, oh, well, this part of my attitude, this part of my personality, this part of my actions cannot go with the Lord. And I got to modify, adjust, Pray and ask God to help me move this stuff out while I'm trying to follow him. Now, I'm following him as I am. I, I'm not going, well, uh, God, I'm going to wait to follow you until I clean up first. No. Follow him just with, with all your stuff. Keep on following. But start making the sacrifices as you go. Mm -hmm. And you'll be surprised how the Lord will assist as you produce and make those sacrifices. Verse 6. And the heavens shall declare his righteousness. And that's the only righteousness that's going to be declared. There's not going to be any declaration of, oh, did you see the righteousness of Wayne? No. Because the scripture says that our righteousness it's not in God's sight it's is like filthy rags. Mm -hmm. All right. So the only right. And so what I need then, if I want to have any badge of righteousness at all, I have to take the righteousness that was given or imputed to me. And bring that back to God. God, I've given to you the glory that you have given to me of righteousness by Jesus. So that's how come it's his righteousness that will be shined, 
the righteousness that, that he has and the righteousness that he gave, they will all be given back to him. All right? and, and, and that's an important thing to keep in mind. That is uh, essential. Because if you don't have righteousness, you can't stand before God. You can't do it. So therefore, you got to have it. And you go, well, I got, I got, how am I going to get it? You got to get it from God. Declare his righteousness, for God is judge himself. Okay, so if you don't have God's righteousness, he will judge you. And then the psalmist put that sila. Now you pause and calmly think about that. If I don't have God's righteousness, I can't go to God. And so when he comes from heaven to earth, and he's got fire, and, and, and he's, he's bringing the judgment, I am going to be judged. All right? Now, in verse 7, we're going to make a little turn here. We were talking about the, the descriptive aspect of God. Now we're going to listen to the narrative of God. Look what it says. It says, hear, O oh, my people. God is saying, I'm talking to my people. And I will speak. You notice that the flavor here now, it's like God is using the psalmist, but now God is letting us now know that he's speaking directly to us through the psalmist. Forget about Asap right now. His mouth may be moving, or his tongue, his, his, uh, his pen may be writing, his quill may be writing, but God is saying, this is me. Understand who's talking to you. And look what he said. Now, you say, well, all the word of God is God. Yes, it's inspired. But in this particular thing, this is God saying, this is me speaking to you. Pay attention. Hear, oh, my people. That's what? I just said it. Pay attention. Listen. You got ear. Jesus often said, he that hath ears to hear, let him hear. What the Spirit saith unto the church. Hear, oh, my people, and I will speak. Now, that I will speak is so important because what that tells us is that God is speaking all the time. God is ever speaking, ever calling, ever seeking. He's always doing that. It's just a matter of whether we are tuned in. See, there's radio broadcast going through where I am and where you are right now. But we're not hearing it. Why? Because we don't have a transistor radio or some other kind of uh, radio, and we don't have it tuned in to the particular bandwidth. But it's going, it's, it's, people are talking all, all around us in the airwaves. There's sound and music and conversation and news and weather reports and traffic reports all around us. We're just not tuned in to hear it. So, same thing. God is speaking in every kind of conceivable way to every one of our problems, to every one of our situations. But do we have the radio turned on? And are we listening? Or are we listening to our own self? Sometimes it's like, Am I going to turn on the radio and listen to the music, or am I going to sing my own song? So sometimes what happens is we're singing our own stuff. We just play our own tune, and we're singing something that sounds good. It sounds like how to read it, but it's not what God is broadcasting. Because a lot of times you sing an old song, and God's got a new one. He's trying to get you to, to hear. Hear, O my people, and I will speak. O Israel, talking to his chosen people. God speaks to his people. Jesus said that uh, uh, my sheep know my voice, and another they will not follow. Hear, O Israel, and I will testify against thee. I am God, even thy God. He's letting you know, if you want to step out and you want to not pay attention, you don't want, I want to let you know, I am God, even thy God. Now, that's an important thing to keep in mind. It, he's talking to Israel from a sense of him seeing that they are going astray. But he's also saying, you are my people. And why do I know that? Because he says, I am God, even thy God. That's highly encouraging. When God says, I'm your God. Because he's identifying that he has not cast you out. But then he also may be saying, but I got some stuff to say to you. We, we went through the book of Revelation and we saw that the Lord Jesus was talking to the seven churches. 
And he's, he went to the seven churches and he talked to them, letting them know what they need to do. But he also told them, if you don't do these things, I will cast you out. See, that means if you don't take on what I'm saying, you will no longer be part of my correction, my rebuke, my discipline. Those things are, ne are a necessity for those whom God has called because we're not going to do it right. And we got to recognize God will discipline. Oftentimes we think, well, God's speaking to me. He's helping me. He's comforting me. That's true. And he does. But he also disciplines. And if you don't think God is trying to discipline you, then that, thing, that means, oh, I got it going. I, I'm not doing anything that God is displeased with. Of course we are. All right? But then the, the, the love and the goodness and the kindness of God allows us to continue and to grow and to move. Look at Peter. Look at how many times he messed up. Look at Thomas. Look at all these other disciples that, you know, they were following Jesus, but they had issues with how they thought things should be. And even after he was, was dead, buried, and resurrected, and he came, and they still said, are you now? This, and they said this as a group, so obviously they all talked about it, and they agreed to this. And this is after Judas was gone. They said, are you now going to establish uh, your kingdom? And they're still looking for him to overthrow Rome. They still didn't get the process. They still were looking for something else to happen. And therefore, what happens? They set themselves up for disappointment because they're putting their focus. God, I think you want, you want to and ought to do this. And my heart is in this, and I'm looking forward. And they obviously was conversating and talking to each other that we, should, God's going to do this. Are you going to do it now? Because we thought you were going to do it when you were first here, but you didn't. So you must be going to do it now. And God, he's, and Jesus is like, no. You're not on the right path. So therefore, drop your agenda. Drop your, 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 your roadmap that you have and listen. Hear me. Hear what I have to say to you and follow. How? I'm following by faith because obviously I don't know where we're going. You're not overthrowing Rome? Well, then I don't know what you're going to do then. And that's good. That's a, that's a good thing when you can admit I don't know what's going to happen. But that doesn't change the fact that I do know I'm going to follow the Lord. Whatever happens, that's where I'm going to be. Wherever God goes, that's where I'm going to go. Now, I'm going to try my best to understand. I'm going to try my best to get insight. I'm going to try my best to focus. But if I feel like I'm groping in the dark, that's fine because my, my, my focus is to follow Jesus. I got to follow him. All right? Why? Because, um, look at verse 8. I will not reprove thee for thy sacrifices. So he says, I'm not going to be mad at you because you made the sacrifices. That's not why I'm coming here to, with, with discipline and rebuke. Nor thy burnt offerings to have uh, them continuously before me. I know you're doing, you go through all that stuff and you, you go through all your rituals, your religious stuff. You go to church, you read your Bible, you pray. I'm not upset with that. Okay, but he goes, look at verse 9. I will take no bullock out of thy house, nor he go out of thy fold. All right? I'm not looking for any more than what you've already been doing. I'm not trying to tell you to increase it or to do more. <laughs> well, I'm going to go to church every day of the week, 24 hours a day. I'm not looking for you that. That's not what he's looking for. I'm going to give every goat I got. I'm going to give every bullock I got. No, God is saying, that's not what I'm looking for. If you think that that is, well, if you want a bullock, I'm going to give you two. No, that's not what God is saying. And look how he I look at how, how he evidences this. Look at verse 10. For every beast in of the forest is mine. He goes, I own them all anyway. You ain't giving me something I already don't. <laughs> he goes, they're all mine anyway. And so you think you're doing me something, you think you're doing something wonderful hmm. because you're going through all this religious aspect, and God is saying, Every beast is, is, is mine. And the cattle upon the thousand hills. They all belong to me. So don't try to bring religiosity. <coughs> don't try to be super, you know, duper religious. You know, that whole concept of being so heavenly minded, you're no earthly good. 
you got to be able to recognize I do have something God wants me to do. That's why I was born. That's why he called me. There's a task. Right? Now, not all the tasks are fun. And I always try to think about that when, when you go through a time in life. I go, John the Baptist had a task. And his task was not fun. But that's why Jesus said there was nobody born of woman greater than John the Baptist. Because he lived up to his task. And his task was not one that I would want anybody to have to deal with or to go through. But for whatever reason, God allowed him to go through it. Look at Abraham. Look what Abraham called. I'm going to tell you you're going to have a son. And then I'm going to wait till you're well, well past the age of having children before I allow it to happen. Then after you do have the child, I'm going to suggest to you that you offer that child back up to me. And that's not fun. It's not a good day. But it's something that God does in our mind to help break us out of the thinking that we are so focused on in this world. And once you say, you know what, I'm just going to trust God. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And, and that's what you basically got to do. You got to stop trying to do the math. And man, did I have to learn that. And that's, but let me tell you, though. I'm still learning. That. When you do that, it frees you. I mean, you're, you're, you're like, wow. And now I, I'm trying to just like, okay, let me stop doing the math here. Let me, because when you stop doing the math, you begin to trust God. Let me stop adding it up. Well, if I do this and I do that and do that, it must equal this. Okay. And, and, and in your mind, that may make sense. But if you stop doing it and just, I'm, you know, I'm just going to trust God. I'm going to do what's right. I'm going to love the Lord. I'm going to love people. I'm going to care. I'm going to do. And I'm just going to let God handle the math. All right? And when you do that, you're going to find yourself being free. All right? Uh, but it ain't easy. Oh, it's not easy. It's definitely it not sounds easy. More, it sounds easy. Mm -hmm. But it ain't easy. No. Because we are wired to do the math. We are wired to do the math, yes. The, and that wiredness is to work against God. So we were born to work against God. And we have to rewire ourselves. Exactly. And exactly. be born again yep. to trust God. That's right. That's right. That's what you, you, got, you got. That's why you got to be born again. And then what did uh, Paul say to the Romans? Be not conformed to this world, but be what? Transform. How? By the renewing of your mind. You got to rethink it. So I got I to gotta stop trying to figure God out. Or put, God must see it like this. Because And how do I know God sees it like this? Because if this is this, plus this is this, then it must equal this. No. Mm -hmm. God has way different kind of math. You know how in, in school today they say the kids today do a new math? <laughs> well, God's got math that we have not ever seen. Mm -hmm. And we got to just trust him. We just got to trust him. And that's the bottom line. Can I have faith in God? So he said, I'm not looking for you to do anything, any kind of super duper sacrifice or any type of thing. Don't be trying to, you know, do something that says, well, look what I did for God. God saying, you keep all your cattle, keep all your, 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 your oxen, keep all your, because all of them belong to me anyway. All right. Verse 12. Look what he says. He says, if I were hungry, I wouldn't tell thee. So he's like, he's like, what can you give me to satisfy me? Right? I mean, what is it that I'm that God is lacking? They go, so oh, I can't I can't I can't truly have a good day until I can get you know somebody to, to do this. God is not having that conversation with himself. God is always God, he's always complete, he's always perfected in everything he thinks or does. All right, and he's never caught off guard, and he's and, and he's never surprised. So therefore, uh, he's like there's nothing you can do to go like, oh, well, now I'm full. I was not full. I still had a little twinge of an appetite until you did that as my child. No, that's not what God is saying. It's always the other way around. You're the one that's in need of fulfillment. You're the one that's in need of sustenance. God is the one that feeds us. All right? He says, if I were hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine. So see what he's saying? He goes, he goes, what, what you gonna what you gonna cook up? You gonna get some potatoes? They're my potatoes anyway. You gonna get some grapes and some cherries? They're all mine anyway. But God is saying also, stop what you're gonna see here in a minute. I'm, I'm gonna give you a little uh, get a little ahead of myself. Is that 
And when, you, when God mentions the word hungry, what do you think about? And he's going to show you, that I'm going to prove here my math, not hungry, because you go, when I say hungry, you're going to start adding this up and adding that up and adding this up, and it must equal this. And he's going to say, no, because I'm, I'm pulling it from somewhere way different. It ain't got nothing to do with appetite for food, though he used that word. All right? And he goes, uh, and the fullness thereof. So he's letting you know that, that the whole world is mine and the fullness thereof. Verse, 11, verse uh, uh, 13. Look what he says. I will eat the flesh of bulls. It's, no, let me say it again. Will I eat the flesh of bulls or drink the blood of goats? Is that what you think I am, am looking to do when you bring your sacrifices? And I mentioned that if I was hungry, are you, are you adding it and, and, and doing math about that? He goes, I know you probably are. He goes, that's how you think. And look what he says. Verse 14. Offer unto God thanksgiving. And pay thy vow unto the Most High. Now look at that. So if God was looking to get some substance, he's saying that he wouldn't ask you for it. But he's a giver of food. And if you really want to be full with the Lord, the Lord says he can make you full by you doing what? Giving thanksgiving to God. You giving to God thanksgiving will fill you up. Paying your vow, I'm going to do this for the Lord, is not going to make God feel, oh, my child is good. I feel good now. No, it's gonna, God's going to take it and fill your joy. Your coffers of joy will get full. Okay? But see, that's a different kind of math. You know, if this, if this ain't berries and, 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 and peaches and and, and, and baked chicken that's going to make you full. These are what's going to make you full. All right? Pay my vow unto the, the, unto the most high. All right? Verse 15. And call upon me in the day of trouble. Now, I got to pause there. Look at what God is saying will fill you up. Because it, it, it goes to him and he takes what you giving, not that he needs it because he doesn't need anything, but he takes what you give and gives it what? Right back to you. So you fill yourself up by taking what you have and giving it to God. But look at this one here. Look at 15. And upon me in the day... Call. And, I'm sorry. And, and call upon me in the day of trouble. So what he's saying is when you are in trouble, I can fill you up how? If you just be in trouble and cry, if you be in trouble and complain, if you be in trouble and point fingers, if you be in trouble and blame everybody else, none of that's going to fill you up. You're going to still feel void, empty, and whatever the trouble is, it will just continue to grow. But look what he says. He says, and call upon me. So he's saying, in the dead trouble, come to me. Call upon me. And look what he says. I will deliver thee. Now, either we need to take that out the scripture or we got to believe it. Which one are we going to do? All right. And you can't do this without stop doing the math. If you're doing the math, you're going to get frustrated because you're going to be like, well, I don't see how that's going to happen. I don't see Because in your mind, you don't see it. You're looking at all the circumstances. You're looking at your health. You're looking at your relationships. You're looking at your bank account. And you're like, well, I don't see it ever happening. Well, keep doing the math because you're not bringing it to God. To give it to God, he said, cast your cares on the, <coughs> and the whole concept. And he didn't say, uh, just bring them. He said, cast. And when you cast it, you have to throw it out of your hand. You know, some people, when they cast the dice, they shake them up and they throw them out of their hand down to the corner of the wall. So the Lord is saying, take your problems and cast them unto me. That means you got to let them go and give it to him. 
hard for us to do, especially if we're in the control aspect. I want to be able to know what's going on here. I want to know what's happening here. I want to understand what's that. Oh, but do I want to walk by faith and not by sight? Is that what I really want to do? No, I want to kind of walk by sight. And he said, well, I'm not trying to see everything yet, but you're trying to feel your way all the way through. You still, you, you got the sight of the hands or the touch. I want to touch this and touch that, you know. And you're still not walking by faith. It's still a sight of perception. I might not be perceiving with my hands, but I can perceive with my understanding. I can perceive with my concepts. I can perceive with my intelligence. I'm trying to perceive all this. I'm trying to touch all this stuff and making sure that it makes sense to me before I keep moving on. Rather than casting it to God. I'm just going to give it to God. I'm not, I, don't, I don't need it to make sense to me. I got faith that God is not confused. Well, that's faith. And like uh, uh, Miss Penny said, it's not always that easy to do because we are, we, we are comfortable with what we're comfortable with. We're, we're like having a little something to hold on to. to be like, okay, well, I got that. But even that sometimes got to be let go. Right? And we saw that with our, our good friend Peter. You know, when he's like, I know I'm not going to ever deny you. And Jesus is like, yes, you are. The things that you're holding on to, that you think add up, and you add it all up in your mind. I know what I trust. I know what I believe in and all that kind of stuff. Uh, but Jesus knew that he didn't have what he thought he had. So you might as well cast it away anyway. Because what you think you're trusting in, what you think you're holding on, what you think you're gripping on to, is going to let you down anyway. The only thing that's going to hold you strong is your faith in Jesus. You've got to have faith in God. All right. Um, so he says in 15, let's finish this up and call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver thee and thou shalt glorify me. Look at that. We lift up God. He delivers us. We're working just as a wonderful team. Not that I understood it. Not that I can even explain it, but I'm delivered. It's an important thing. 16. All right. He's going to make another change of pace here. Okay. Look at 16. But unto the wicked, God saith. Now, a whole different conversation here. All right. But unto the wicked, he saith, what has thou to do to declare my statutes? Or thou shouldest take my covenant in thy mouth. He said, what, what else what could I have done? What else should have been accomplished for you to declare my statutes or to say the things and, the, and have the conversation, the, uh, the conversation of God? God has done all that he can do. He's shown us all his glory. He's shown us his strength. He's shown us his love. He's shown us his kindness. Look at verse 17. Seeing thou hateth instruction. There's the key. You hate instruction. I don't see. Who hates instruction? A person that wants to be their own Lord. I want to be my own God. See, going back to that very simple concept that Jesus said. Why call me Lord, Lord, if you're not willing to do what I say? Well, if you hate instruction, you don't want to do what anybody tells you to do. You know how sometimes you see people, sometimes it's a parent to a child or a husband to a wife, a wife would tell a husband something, and the husband like, I ain't doing that. I'm not, I don't want to do that. Then the husband will go out, they be out eating for dinner, and there'll be some friends, and the friends will tell that husband the same thing the wife has been telling them for years. And all of a sudden, the husband like, you know, that's a good idea. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that. You know, and then the wife looking at him, man, I've been telling you that for decades. Why, you know, what, but it had to come from what? Somebody else. And so, why? Because you hate instruction from the people that are trying to help you. I ain't, I, I, I'm not going to listen to you. Who are you? I've been married to you. The wife has been trying to tell the husband to do that for decades, and he ain't doing it. Right? Sounds familiar. And vice versa. <laughs> no children to mother. And uh, but yet at the same time, you know, you gotta just like okay, that's how they are. They don't want to hear instruction. 
So if they don't want instruction, that means they want to be their what? Own Lord. Mm -hmm. I want to do what I want to do. Mm -hmm. Therefore, Jesus said, you know, why call me Lord, Lord? Because you're not going to do what I, what I tell you. You're not going to follow my instructions. So therefore, if, you, if Jesus is not your Lord, then you are your own. And it's this little statement here, seeing thou hateth instruction, is so important. And cast my words behind thee. God's words are bringing forth, and you're like, I'm not going to do what he says. Why? Because I'm going to do what I want to do. Right? And that goes all the way back to, to the Garden of Eden. The words were said, don't eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That was discarded, cast behind, and something else was done. I'm going to do another thing other than what God has said. And therein is the genesis of all of the struggles. But that was the same thing that was found in Satan. But then he goes on. He talks about now your trends Look at, and, and, and the way you lean. Look at verse eight, 18. When thou uh, sawest a thief, then thou consented with him. I see people doing wrong. I see somebody stealing, taking advantage of somebody. And you know what? I'm like, oh, that's good. I, I think I'm going to try that too. I'm going to try to steal too. I think it's interesting that in America, we used to say that it was wrong to steal from people by gambling. Because you know when you gamble, eventually all you're going to end up doing is taking people's money anyway. And so the numbers runner, back when I was a kid, if you were running numbers, you would get arrested and you get thrown in jail. People that were taking bets on games was illegal. Today, the government does it. We got Lotto and Mega Ball and, and, and Powerball and you know get rich this and get rich that. Everybody's trying to do everything they can. And they give... Every now and then they give, you know, one, one individual will pop up with a winner to entice everybody else. And they pop that person on, make sure he's on every newscast, got all kinds of specials. Ooh, what this person did with all that money they won. So you can keep, well, I want to do it too. And instead, why don't we just stop trying to focus on building ourselves and building our souls? Mm. But that's not part of the agenda that uh, this world promotes. All right, so a thief, he consents with him and has taken and has been a, par a, a partner with harlots, with adulterers, rather. And so even um, the whole aspect of, well, what does God care about where I lay down to have a sexual uh, concept or relationship with what does God got to say about it? why does God need to be in my bed well guess what he is whether you invite him or not <coughs> he's there and he's aware and oftentimes it becomes such a mute point people don't even think about it nowadays hey, I'm just going to go out I'm going to hang I'm going to do this I'm going to be living with this one hanging with that one doing that liking this person, liking person that I ain't supposed to like, liking two or three people, all that, it ain't even no big deal today. It ain't even news. But God is still there. And it's still being marked as wrong. Okay? And so therefore, now, if you're a thief and you know you're a thief and you say, God, help me because I, 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 I can't help. I'm always stealing. You are you on that other part. You're not on, you're not on the destruction part. You're on the development part. If you are adulterer and a whoremonger, whatever it is, and you, I, Lord, I'm always lusting, I'm always, but I need help. Well, then you're on the other part too. You're on the part where God's rebuke will work with you. God's chastisement will work with you. He will, he, he will call you his child and he will discipline you and he will help you and he will school you and help. But if you like, I'm not listening to what he's saying because I don't want to hear none of his, his instructions. <coughs> Anything he says, all his words, I'm putting behind me, and I'm going to steal when I want to steal, and I'm going to commit adultery when I want to commit adultery. Well, now, this is talking about you. See, So that's why you can say two people could be doing the same wrong. One will make it to heaven. The other will find themselves <coughs> in hell. 
because of how you see it. If you see yourself as a sinner, God, I'm wrong. And your word has told me, and I want your word to be in me, and I agree with your word. I just can't live to live <coughs> to it yet. I'm struggling. Well, you're going to be all right. You're going to get discipline. <laughs> you're going to get some correction. All right? Don't think you, life is going to be wonderful. You're going to still have to deal with it, the consequences. But God will work <coughs> on your side. But if you're casting all his words behind you, I'm not paying attention to any of this, this God stuff. I'm going to reject all of his instructions, then you're going to have some problems eternally. And that's uh, not a good thing. All right, let's finish this up. I'm, I'm past my time. 19. Thou givest thy mouth to evil. This is the person here that, that, that hates instruction. He's already lined up with thieves. He's lined up with, a, with the adulterer. And now he's given his mouth to evil. He's, as if, and his tongue reframeth uh, deceit. Fam uh, frameth deceit. So you speak bad things and you are a liar. So look what he's saying. So he's saying you're a thief, an, a, a, a lustful adulterer, you're evil, and you're a liar, and you're, de and you're deceitful. Why? Because that's the nature of man. That's what we are apart from God. That's how we will show ourselves. We are certainly selfish if we don't have God. 20. Thou sittest and speaketh against thy brother. Don't have no allegiance, no loyalty, no sense of empathy for someone that you should care for. Why? Because you're only caring for yourself. Speaketh against thy brother, thou uh, slandereth thy own mother's son. Who's your own, who's your mother's son? That's your brother. All right, so once again, treacherous, treacherous person. 21. These things thou, uh, these things hast thou done, and I kept silent. Ooh. That should be underlined. Because when you do this kind of dirt, and God keeps silent, you know what that means? You are not his child. He's not, because he, he ain't looking at it. I need to correct my children. He's seeing you as the devil's child. That's what Jesus told the Pharisees. Your father is the devil. And he let the Pharisees go and do what they wanted to do. But he corrected his disciples. I kept silent. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such as uh, one as thyself. You thought I was like you? That because I kept silent, I was agreeing with you? No, 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 no. Wrong thinking. That was the worst kind of math right there. But I will reprove thee. All right? So, reprove you. In other words, I'm going to prove you wrong. Right? He, he's not trying to redeem you, the person. He's going to reprove them. I set them in, in order before thine eyes. Look at 22. Now consider this. Ye that forget God, lest I tear you in pieces. Wow, I don't know how much more... <laughs> descriptive you want to get what he's letting you know is that he's going to allow you to totally be separated from God we don't know what it is like to be separated from the presence of God because because even right now that's why the scripture said it rains on the just and the unjust we get the spirit of God falling on all of us whether we are sinner or saint we still have it but when it, that eternity comes he will separate and we don't know how that feels. Some, and, and, you know, I often think, I wonder if that is something akin to what hell is like. When, you, when God is ripped, the, the God in you, because the scripture says we are made in the image of God. And when that uh, identification image is ripped from you, it tears you in pieces. You know? um, I can't imagine. I just know that's not good. And there be none to deliver. When God removes his spirit, who's going to come and put the spirit back in? Nobody. Our final verse. Whoso authoreth praise glorifies me. 
This is a conclusion. If you're offering up praise, if you're thanking God, you're glorifying me. Jesus, uh, uh, God says. And to him that offereth his conversation aright, will I show the salvation of God. Now he concludes with hope. If you offer up praise, if you recognize that God is who he say he is. Now, what does that praise mean? Oh, God is wonderful? Well, yes, that's part of it. But the concept of praising God is acknowledging that he is who he say he is. And that I need to find a means of connection. When you start seeking, God says, if, if, you, if you come unto me, I will what? In no wise cast you out. But you got to want to come to God. So therefore, if anybody says, I need God, because I, I, don't, I don't think my life in this world is what it's supposed to be. I need to find God. Well, God will introduce himself to you. I don't care where you're from or who you are or what, what your background is. God will introduce himself to you and you'll get to know him like he said he would. He said, if you come to me, I will not cast you out. So it's important, as this last verse here points out, that we seek God and we worship him for who he is. We glorify him, we praise him, and we lift him up for being a God that does give instruction, that does give correction, that does give uh, direction. He will do that. And he will help you and comfort you through your struggles, through your difficulties. Um, will you have difficulties? Of course. Yes, you will. All right, but... God says, I'll be there with you. Now, if you don't want to, if you hate his instruction, if you hate all that he tries to do, you take his words and you cast them behind you, then verses 18 to 22 is what you're going to be dealing with. And uh, that's not what we want. And we want to pray and, and, and hope that uh, all of our uh, loved ones, the people that we come in contact with, will in some way be able to identify and see this. All right, we're going to stop. We're past our time. I apologize.